Yeah, okay. He's talking and then you won't hear my voice when it's edited together. So it's kind of repeat questions back, set the okay. questions up. So yeah, okay. We, um, oh, first please say your name for the editor. Please. Yeah, I'm George Walker. And so George, you were uh, uh, kind of one of the uh, original sort of drivers or backup drivers. Or, yeah. Uh, can you yeah, explain that to us? Yeah, Cassidy did the, most of the driving when he was with us and uh, I was kind of the number two driver. And then Cassidy didn't drive back. When we got to New York, he had to go back to his job, so we kind of divided up the driving on the way back from New York across the country, across Canada and stuff. Was it hard to drive? This yeah, it's hard. It's really, it is pretty hard to drive. Uh, no power steering and it's heavy, so it takes a lot of effort to steer it, especially when it's going slow. You know, in traffic and stuff, it's really hard. And it was hard to shift. I, I don't think I, I think I was the only one that ever figured out how to work the gearbox. Including Cassidy. Inclu Cassidy, that we had this ongoing thing called third gear mania. He could never get it into third gear, and he didn't realize that it, it, it had a funny shift pattern. And it doesn't shift like a normal four speed uh, because it's an overdrive. So what should be third is actually overdrive gear. So you drive, you shift it first, second, fourth, and then into what would be third would be overdrive. So instead of going one, two, three, four, it goes one, two, three, which is really the, the direct drive gear. And then where you would normally find third was the overdrive gear. Right, right. And when, when, you, uh, when you took that first trip across, you, did you have any sort of idea about the legacy you were creating or how this all was going to play? No, we weren't trying to do anything spectacular other than just make, you know, ha have a fun trip. and. Uh, We'd all, a bunch of us been playing with film. Hagen and I both had some movie cameras and, we're, and we were playing with film. And they thought, well, let's film this thing and make a movie of it. It'll be an interesting little movie. Yeah, yeah. So, but that was about the, the extent of our impact that we thought we would have would be, you know, a, a very minor kind of a movie. Yeah, yeah. And we weren't, certainly weren't trying to set ourselves up as any kind of uh, cultural icons or anything <laughs> like that. Don't start the day thinking that. No. And the, um, um, and Cassidy didn't let anybody else drive, really. He kind of hogged the wheel, didn't he? Well, it wasn't so much that. Uh, he always preferred to drive. Uh, and I understand that. I always prefer to drive. I don't like having anybody else drive. And Cassidy was a pretty good driver. And, and he was a very spectacular driver, and you know he was kind of the star of the show at the wheel. So there was really no, other than when he'd get too tired, there was really no reason to have anybody else drive. You know he he could do it and liked to do it, and he was the most fun to watch driving. So <laughs> what was fun about watching him? Well, he he's very kinetic. You know he wouldn't just sit there. You know I don't know if you've seen any of the film, yeah, yeah. but but he's always doing stuff, gesticulating this way and that. He's rolling a joint with one hand and steering with the other. He's always doing something. You know, he, Cassidy was one of those really nervous, high energy people that could never sit still, and he wouldn't sit still driving either. So he was, and he was always talking. He was, you know, rapping away constantly and talking about stuff. And he, so he was, you know, carrying on constantly. So whether anyone was listening or not? Yeah, right, it didn't make any difference. <laughs> He'd, he'd be talking whether anybody was listening or not. A lot of times nobody listened because you couldn't understand what he was saying anyway. And what about the reaction you got from uh, people in the South or New York City? Had they seen a group like yours rolling through or people just kind of nope. indifferent to it? Or? No, most people were not indifferent. Most people reacted. And most people reacted pretty favorably. You know, they were amused by it. It was this amusing thing. Nobody knew what the heck it was because right. it wasn't one of anything anybody had ever seen. and There would never be anything like it. So we kind of impacted people. And the South, uh, I think that they figured we were freedom riders because it was the time when busloads of people were going down there for civil rights reasons. And uh, we even accidentally uh, integrated Lake Pontchartrain when we got to the New Orleans. Yeah. It was a hot, sweaty day, and we saw the water and jumped in and looked around. and. Gee, there weren't very many white people where we jumped in the lake. In fact, all the white people where we jumped in was us. <laughs> was that a problem? No, it wasn't. Uh, there were a couple people that kind of were a little grumpy about it, but I remember one guy said, hmm, a lot of trash in the water today. <laughs> <laughs> what was, uh, was the last time you rolled on the bus? What was the last trip you took out? I don't remember. Okay. It's been so long ago, I don't remember when the last what trip I took out. What do you think about off. pulling it out today? I was all for it. Yeah. Yeah, I've been wanting to do this for decades. I've been wanting to see if we couldn't put it back together. I think so wh it, where, where does she go from now? Well, that remains to be seen, I guess. Uh, there's a lot of talk around. Uh, 
Zane has talked about somebody raising some money to do restoration work on it, and people are talking about the huge amount it would take, which I think is really not true. I talked to the factory, uh, Gillig, in Hayward, California, that built it originally, uh -huh. and they said, no problem, you know, as far as the body's concerned, we can fix whatever's wrong with it, okay. you know, up to and including building it all new like it was, and it's nowhere near that bad. And they showed me one that they had done at that time, which was probably 20 years ago, and it was older than this. And yeah, it looked like that. And they said, yeah, we, we built it. We can just take it apart and put new panels on it. Wherever they're rusted, we can put new panels on it. And it wasn't going to cost a huge fortune, you know. That seems like it's in pretty good shape. It really is. And, and mechanically, it's really easy. You know, trucks are all pretty universal. Uh, I replaced everything on the new bus from the radiator to the rear tires in about a month you know, with just you know parts that I found and we rebuilt an engine and you know junkyard parts you know everything is fresh on that there's no none of the running gear except the front axle uh, from what was on it before it replaced everything and we do the same thing here just get another engine these engines are plentiful and cheap uh, probably fix the gearbox it's got some broken gears uh, don't know if we can find the gearbox but if we can replace you know do that Probably put a different rear end under it, uh, or at least different brakes, because this was really inadequate for brakes. Yeah. And all new brakes on the front, I'd say. Just pull off the backing plates and put a whole new brake system on the front, just hanging on that axle. Yeah. Wheels and tires, and you know, got it, and it's ready to run. Yeah. Did you expect more problems pulling it out today? Or about what no, it's just about what I thought. Okay. It was just, I thought it would be hard to get it started, and once we moved it a foot, it would be pretty easy. Yeah and have to clear stuff out of the way, and that's just what we did. Was it hard steering it from up there? A little. Once it's moving, it's not too bad. Right. Trying to turn it with just sitting is real hard. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you have to tug on it like you're uh, really hauling on a rope yeah. or something. But. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, switching a little bit, so do you, do you think of this thing as um, the bus here as a way to kind of let young people know about what happened then and some possibilities, or is that well, too grandiose? I, I don't think of it like that much. I just think of it as it's a piece of history. You know, it's a, it's a cultural piece of history. And I like to see things preserved. I like I like old houses. I like old cars. I like old stuff to be preserved, and this thing is significant. And for that reason, I'd like to see it preserved. I'd like to see it fixed up and preserved and able to drive around and maybe make a few appearances from time to time. But I don't have any illusions about us being any uh, be-all, know-all of society or anything. We were just a bunch of young people out on a lark having fun. And, yeah. and what, do you, what do you think Ken would have thought about pulling it out? Oh, he didn't want to really do it. Yeah. Uh, I talked to him about it, and he, he really liked the idea of stuff just rot, rotting into the ground. And I can I understand that viewpoint. I don't share it, but I, can, I understand it. And, you know, that's just a different viewpoint, and that was his idea. And Faye didn't really want it to just pollute the swamp forever. You know, it probably would be leaking oil and stuff like that. So, you know, it's bad for the water table. And e ecologically, just letting it rot out there was probably not a good idea. So. And now it's up here, so step now one. Uh, step one, yeah, here it is. And... Uh, you know, it's got this much, much momentum on it, so I don't know. We'll see what happens if uh, some money gets raised. I, I told Zane that if people really want to do that, that I'd help some oh, and give them advice on how to do it because I've, you know, I've kind of searched out parts for over the years just yeah. in case we wanted to do that. And yeah. I've got an idea how to look for what it needs, and I pretty much know what it needs to, to get it driving. Yeah. You know, I've kind of mentally been through the whole process. and. Yeah. Several of the people are still available to repaint it. Uh, Roy, who was one of the originals, and is a very good painter, and is always looking for work, and would like doing it. I'm sure that you know it would be the kind of thing that would put several of us together and hire us for a summer or a few weeks, and uh, you know we'd have it looking good. I'd say we'd look at a lot of the old photographs and reproduce a lot of stuff. And, it was painted many times over. It, was, it wasn't like it had a paint job that we'd have to reproduce. It, it was completely painted over numerous times over the years. I can think of at least four or five times it was completely repainted over and redone. Yeah. So, you know, a little of this, a little of that, and yeah, a little well, of that. Zane says when people ask him, uh, are you going to restore the original paint job? And he says, well, which one? Yeah, yeah exactly. They're, 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 there never was an original paint job, you know. We started painting on it, and we never stopped until we parked it. Work in progress. Yeah, it was a constant work in process. Yeah. Uh, and a couple times we just said, well, let's change it. And yeah. 
I remember they had a rally in Berkeley, Vietnam Day, when there was all this protest for the war and stuff. And uh, so we painted it over completely in kind of blood red color and put a bunch of uh, stuff that looked like symbols on it, you know, war symbols of various kinds. You went to overseas at that rally, if I uh, We so went in uh, chanting, Bomb Vietnam, Bomb Vietnam. <laughs> There was a, a big uh, confrontation between the, the peace ralliers and the Hells Angels. And we'd been hanging out some with the Hells Angels. And uh, so we showed up at Sonny Barger's house with Kesey and Cassidy and uh, Allen Ginsberg. Mm -hmm. And uh, sat down and had kind of a peace talk with them. And, uh, at the rally, to back up a, a few hours, because that was in the evening afterwards, but at the rally, uh, when Kesey got up to do his thing, to give his talk, because he was one of the keynote speakers, he looked around and saw all these people agitating with all their militant anti-war stuff, and he took out his harmonica and played a real slow version of Home on the Range for everybody. <laughs> Just to kind of blow everybody's mind. And then he said, if you look around, you'll see all these guys in suits. And they've got these little colored pins in their lapels. He said, uh, I can't remember the exact details. The CIA have the red pins and the FBI are the blue pins. <laughs> and he looked around and said, all these guys taking pins out of their lapels. <laughs> well, it looks like you guys twisted that around a little bit. We twisted everything yeah, around. That was what it was always about. I expect you guys to show up and you know, yeah. be carrying the flag for the anti-war. Yeah, stuff. no, we were always into twisting things around. We were never into going anybody else's trip. Yeah. It was always about just making things, making people think, you know, because people weren't thinking. Kesey said that when we got there, it reminded him of old movies of the Nazi Nuremberg rallies, yeah. the war rallies. He said that the, these people were just as militant as the as the fascists. They were just on the other side of the, they're on the other team. It was it was still they were taking on this thing as as though it was a war and they were fighting it, and you don't ever achieve peace by fighting. You don't achieve peace by fighting war. You know, it's still just more war. It's still more fighting, and, and he realized that. And uh, there's a lot of things like that that I learned from Kesey that are really valuable to me in life, because uh, he was, he really had great insights about how people think and operate and what makes people's minds work and stuff. And uh, well, it, it was... Seems, seems like we've got some of that kind of coming back around again. Let's hope. Yeah, yeah let's hope. Yeah. Let's hope that there's something like that coming around again because uh, we need something, you know, we need something. I, the guys that are running stuff now are going down uh, a dead-end road, I'm afraid, yeah. that are running this country in, in bad directions, and I don't think that it'll do the world much good to continue in the current directions of where things are going. I think that we need people that have fresh ideas about what we're about and how to achieve that. And just, just taking things on, like that Vietnam Day thing, taking it on as uh, fighting it, it just it just adds more fuel to the fire. You don't put out a fire by throwing gas on it, and, and that's what that does. You, you have to do it. You, know, you need to protest. You need to let people know that what's going on is, is not good and, it's, and it isn't popular. But you have to do it in a way somehow. And that's a hard thing to figure out. To figure out how to do that, I don't know how to do it. Yeah. But, but Kesey was able to find ways frequently to defuse a situation. I think a lot of it may have come from his uh, experience as a wrestler, because mm -hmm. uh, wrestling is is real one on one thing and using other people's momentum against them. You know, mm -hmm. if you try to take somebody on head to head, there's always a tougher, stronger guy than you. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, I think wrestlers learn how to use people's own momentum against mm -hmm. them and how to work with people in a way that you manipulate them rather than overpower them. And it seemed to be, from what I understand, kind of Kesey's way. You wouldn't call him an overt leader, but he seemed to be some sort of uh, agitator. Yeah, he, yeah, 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 he, was. he yeah. was. He would do that. He, would, he wouldn't always tell us, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Sometimes he would. You know, sometimes, okay, now we're going to, you know, and he'd come up with an idea and we'd do it. And, and he could do it both ways. He could call the plays and be the quarterback or he could just kind of turn people loose and uh, let, let stuff happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it was always so much fun. Was uh, We never really knew what was going to happen. 
One of the nice things I liked about Kesey, whenever he was doing something, he would work hard at not preparing. <laughs> you know, because well, he he wouldn't put a lot of effort into you know planning what what was going to happen. Because then you're just locked into something and you're always surprised and, and you're not ready for what does happen because you're prepared for something else and, and that's never what happens. Especially when you're doing stuff like we were, taking the acid and gathering a bunch of people together and having shows and doing stuff and driving the bus around. You never know where, where you were going to end up or what was going to go on. So well, by the, not preparing, you were really more prepared because yeah. you were... No matter what happened, you hadn't prepared for something else. Yeah. So at least you were open for what happened. After you got back from that first trip, and then what started to ha go down with the acid test, were you surprised at how sort of quickly the thing grew, and, and you know the San Francisco scene, or did it feel like you'd let lightning out of a bottle, or just what, what was that? It like? it didn't really seem like so much like we had let lightning out of the bottle, as just that lightning was out of the bottle. And we were one of many, many forces. You know, there was a lot of forces at play, and it, it was it was karmic and cosmic that it was due to happen then at that time. And uh, a lot of people picked up on it. It wasn't just the bus, or it wasn't just drugs, or it wasn't just music. It wasn't but just San Francisco. Uh, you know, it was happening. A lot of the places in the world it was happening in England. The Beatles and people like that had picked up on it, and uh, you know it happened in academia. Tim Leary and Dick Alpert at Harvard picked up on it, and you know it just and it had started a long time before that. Uh, you know it started right after World War II, I think. Uh, people's consciousness was jolted by that, and a lot of there's always been bright and interesting people paying attention in the world and when things were kind of edgy after that at that time I think a lot of people just were kind of jarred into kind of freedom and started looking for stuff and uh, it, after a while it became clear what it was and, and we just kind of went with it. And then after, after Kesey got out of jail and he sort of said okay we've got to move beyond acid and acid test graduation I mean, was that another prank or another twist or? Well some of, it was somewhat of a prank and somewhat of a twist and uh, for one thing, acid became illegal, so we couldn't just blatantly give everybody acid and have big gatherings because we all ended up back in jail and probably never would have got out you know, if we'd have done that, so we couldn't do that. Also, Kesey was looking at uh, having to grovel a little before the law so he'd, you know, he wouldn't do hard time, and so he had to put on a show for him, and, and I think that there was some of that in it. Uh, also, it was a, kind of a prank because we did take acid at the graduation. We, we weren't. Uh, we were pretending not to, but we did, and you know, so you know, everything was always a little bit of a prank. You know, that, that was what made it fun. That you never completely just gave in to the forces around you. Well, it's good to see you back behind that wheel. Like it was good day. to be. It was good. Felt good to be back behind the wheel. It's it's been a long time since we've done this one. Yeah. Yeah. It uh, still feels a lot like it did. Still steers hard as hell, and one of these days it'll run again. I think. Yeah. That's great, man. Thank you. It's yeah, you, thank you. It yeah. was it was good to have a big crowd here to see that there's at least a, still a few people interested enough to come and check it out. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for letting us be a part. Okay. I do want to introduce you to David here too, because yeah. when Zane was talking about kind of raising money, and David's kind of been spearheading that. Uh huh. George is. David Heeson and George hey, Walker. George. Hi, David. Nice, nice to meet you. Wish sure to fund a restoration, and he and Kesey just didn't hit it off, so it didn't happen. But I went so far as to go into the factory with pictures of it and told him what what it was, how bad it was, and stuff. And Rich said, "No problem. We've done worse. You know, we build it. We can. It's just metal. It's, there's no magic involved. You know, it's just pieces." And it's just, you know, it's riveted together mostly. And we take it apart and make new pieces. We made those pieces, we can make new pieces. We can, and wherever it needs a new piece, we can just put in a new piece. You know? uh, Hayward, California, at least it was then. Yeah, I think it is still there. And mechanically, it's really pretty easy. I replaced all the running gear except the front axle on the other bus, and it took about a month. And most of that time was spent chasing parts and cleaning them up and painting them and stuff. But 
it's it's really not it wouldn't be that much to get it run, running yeah it would not be that hard at all might have to look and make sure that the frame isn't rusted through where things bolt to it but right. that'll be about the it doesn't look to me like it is it looks to me like it's pretty sound yeah. and uh, you know biggest job is going to be just cleaning it up and getting the crap out of it ripping up all the old floorboards and just you know getting down to to where you're working that uh, clean stuff you know getting all the old windows out getting the part to get the windows out and stuff like that Yeah, I think get repainting is not a problem. You just get as many of the original people around as want to do it, and we just you know, start painting on it. You know, get a paint scene going. And start with the base yellow coat again. I would. Yeah, I'd clean it right down. I'd I'd clean it right down to clean metal and put good primer on it and and put school bus yellow on it, and just start in. You know, start with with original photographs, original film of the first day we painted it, which we have all that. And then, you know, start with as much like that as we can and then just embellish it with bits and pieces of later paint jobs. Because the whole thing was completely painted over at least three times. You know, just start fresh. And, and uh, so I think that then we incorporate bits and, you know, some of our favorite aspects of the various paint jobs. And, uh, and do it like that. And, and have the same people do it. And, and, that, and then it's authentic, you know, because we were always painting. It wasn't like, okay, now it's done. That's the paint job. You know, it, it was uh, a happening. To pay. There were, when we were in Mexico with it, that whole summer we spent in Mexico in 66, down in Manzanillo, I spent whole days, day after day after day, weeks, just painting, you know, painting on the bus, you know, sometimes with little tiny paintbrushes, doing little, like, pinstriping and stuff like that, and little detail edging around designs. And I spent... Probably several hundred hours doing that. That's what you do in Mexico, right? Yeah, that's what you do. You know, you sit around, smoke joints, and <laughs> drink drink ninety centavo beer, and uh, and paint on the bus. Nothing else to do. Go surf and go surf for a while, and come back and paint for a while. Lap on the lamb. Lap on the lamb. Yeah. yeah. Well, cool. So uh, that's perfect. Uh, so I I've always thought that the restoration. Everybody's oh god, it's impossible. It's a terrible wreck. But yeah, it's not that hard. It's not that bad. You know, I think that uh, getting it running you could do it with less than $10,000. Wow. If you have it driving for less than $10,000. Yeah, that's certainly the most reasonable. And I'd say the body could be done, I don't know, but back then they were talking some number like 10 to 20, and it's probably more than that now because prices are higher. But, you know, you have to just have them look at it and see. So the factory, though, says they would do it. They, they would do it. They would do it. Yeah, bring it here. They would. They would redo the body. Yeah, yeah, it should be done by the original factory. It should be done by Gillig. Right, they should give us back the 1939 Harvester bus. Yeah. Then we go and we take it, we paint it again. It's yeah. The same process. Yeah, I think before. we we have it driving before we take it to them. We get the we get the running gear done first, I think, yeah. and then take it for the body. Are you local here, George? Some of the time, I'm in Eugene part of the time, and I'm in the Portland area part of the time. I've got property uh, in a little town called Scappoose outside Portland. Oh sure, yeah, up towards Washington. Yeah, I live up there. I'm up there more than I am in Eugene this month, okay. but I've got two houses in Eugene too that I'm working on. So I'm, I'm a slumlord. Real estate magnet. Yeah, real estate magnet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do we have a, do we have any contact information for you? Do we Zane knows how to get a hold of me. Okay. If you want to write it down, I'll give you my phone numbers. We'll yeah. Okay. Right, and Zane's you. got my email, and uh, yeah, from time to time. And some of the things I think we need is a new hood and grill. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, we start looking in uh, stuff like Hemmings Motor News. Mm -hmm. Old truck stuff is a lot cheaper than old car stuff because yeah. not very many people are into them. There's a truck museum down by oh, Sacramento or Stockton or something like that. I would go talk to them and tell them what we're trying to do. We need uh, front end parts for a D50. And, uh, you know, say, so what do you guys got? Do you have anything? Do you know anything? What are your sources? Start go looking, at, looking for sources for stuff. Uh, and I think that you know, you'd find out you'd probably find a hood for a hundred bucks or something, or a couple hundred bucks, and a grill, you know, some of those kind of things. And all the running gear parts, though, these engines, this isn't even the original engine, this is an engine that we put in at Minneapolis when the first engine gave out. Oh, the first jet? Yeah, and it's a, a later model. It's a 50s vintage, it's an R model, or, or what they call a redhead. It's a bigger engine, it's a 455. And the original engine was oh, a 380 or 390, something like that. And was kind of underpowered, so the bigger engine was better. But those engines are plentiful. You know, they built they built hundreds of thousands of them, and you know, nobody really has much use for 
big gas truck engines, but a lot of them are still running. They're good, strong engines, so they're, it's easy to find that. How long were you held up in Minneapolis doing that? Uh, about a day. Okay, not so bad. You no, it wasn't bad at all. Out? Yeah, in and out. They did it at night. They did it overnight. By morning, we were driving out of there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're easy to do. You know, if you've got the equipment, if you've got heavy lifting equipment, you know, you just take off the hood and the front end, the radiator and stuff, and, uh, you know, they're, it's just unbolt. It's just like taking a motor out of a Model A Ford, except it's just bigger and heavier. You just unbolt the mounts and unbolt the, get the radiator out of the way and hook up to it and lift it out with a chain hoist and pull it clear and take it out of there and put one in and then tune her up. So without power or anything, it makes it Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, nothing to hook up to. Just go yeah, through. yeah. But yeah, you know, I mean, you could, I could do it right here. I could put a motor in it right here. Sure. Go yeah. rent a hoist and put a motor in it right here. Yeah. Well, that's great. It's great just to see that too. Yeah, I like to have it on a concrete slab to do it, so you can get a tranny uh, jack underneath the, it for the uh, transmission. You have to roll it on. Have a concrete slab? Yeah, yeah, it does. And uh, it could be done in there, although I kind of have to move the other bus out to do it, which is probably not a good idea. I, what I would do is look for the right, right place. Might even just roll over the other side here. There's a little concrete slab and put the engine and the tranny over that and uh, and then uh, put a tent over it or something. It's temporary. There's something sort of poetic about doing it here. You know? Yeah, there is. Like there, yeah, little, uh, yeah, there is. It'd, it'd be nice. To, I'd like to see it drive away from here. Yeah. The next time it leaves here, I'd like to see it drive away. Yeah. I'd like to drive it away. <laughs> I think one of the hardest things is getting it apart to get all the broken windows out because the way the panels are all screwed on and all the, the, the uh, it's got slotted screws that are all rusty and getting all those out is going to be a real job to get it apart to get the windows out, get new window channel in and all that stuff. That's going to be one of the hardest things. I would advocate cheating a little bit, put Phillips head screws back in and stuff like that. I hate slotted screws. Right, authentic only goes so far. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're not doing this for the Concord de Elegance of, <laughs> of, of uh, Pebble we're Beach. Older, you know, we're yeah. we're not we don't have to fool them to that degree. Right. We're not going to have judges no. with white gloves going over this thing, uh, marking a point off here and there. It's not. It ain't going to be like that. Because <laughs> it was never like that. Right. The thing was rusted out when we got it. Right. It was the roof was already rusting out when we bought it. Yeah. And when we got it, it had a whole interior different in it. Yeah. It, well, it had uh, it had been converted into a motor home by a Catholic with a lot of kids, and who outgrew it and got had to get a bigger one. Had to get a flat front to have get one big enough to get his family in. It had bunk beds in the back. It had three tiers of bunk beds, so they were really tight. Wow. Because it's really low inside. Yeah. And you got you know, I can't even stand up in yeah. it. And so you can imagine three-tiered bunk beds in the back and really crowd kids in. And, and they fell down on two different occasions when Cassidy drove it over curbs with people in them and they yeah. collapsed. Yeah. They weren't built very stout. And then up in the front, on this side, it had a thing kind of like that over there, like a couch, but it folded down like that. Mm -hmm. So that it made a couch folded up and it made a bed folded down. And then there were a couple of the original bus seats. And one of them turned around backwards so it made like, you know, like a booth in a, in a restaurant, you know, like a settee with a table with two facing yeah. seats. And then there was uh, a little counter behind the driver. The first was a refrigerator. It had a gas refrigerator, propane refrigerator, uh, long gone. And then behind that was a counter and it had a, uh, a little two burner, two burner propane hot plate kind of a thing, you know, which was the stove. So, and a sink, it had a sink, and, and I don't know if, I remember, don't remember running water, but I think it meant a, must have had a water tank or something. So it was set up as a liveaboard. It didn't have a toilet. It didn't have a toilet or shower. You had to, you had to go to facilities. It never had a holding tank or a toilet or shower. But I think it had just about everything else. I may be wrong about a sink. It may not have had a sink. Have you gutted that all at first? Or no, no, that, that disappeared over time, uh, over a long time. A lot of it was in it for a long time. And, and some of it died quicker than other parts. The bunks were probably the first to go. We right away cut the turret hole in the back and welded the platform on the back. We had a generator and a motorcycle on the back of it. Gentlemen, 
Thank you for your efforts. No, it's great. It's a pleasure, George. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun doing this. I gotta go have lunch. I'm